Okay, let's forge ahead in this section to talk about um, uh, Australia, it's um, the risks of uh, the climate changing, how we observe and assess what the risks are and what kind of policies are called for or are um, have been instituted in the past in trying to be able to respond to it. Um, so as we see, the, the forest fire, fire danger um, can permeate a all four corners uh, of the country and there's been efforts um, by CSIRO, by private um, non-governmental organizations or think tanks as well as government organizations at trying to observe and assess uh, where we are, what we know, and how we can respond to it. Uh, the most recent um, adaptation strategy document that we're going to be looking at is the most recent one uh, that I can find and it looks at how resilient um, the parts of the country are, where the vulnerabilities are, and how the adaptation strategies, strategies can be developed depending on those factors that we talked about earlier. And uh, they also stress this dual approach at trying to use both mitigation and adaptation. And the more effective uh, and the more um, resources that can be brought to, gear, brought to bear in the mitigation area could have an effect on how much we need to adapt uh, going forward. So a lot of this is just overview of the things we've already seen. I wanted to stress, and I think this document does as well, that the there is an overlap between the efforts that would be considered mitigation and adaptation. Uh, kind of like with the trees that I talked about earlier, there is a lot of um, conceptual and observational overlap and bleed in uh, between different types of uh, factors that we're looking at in this class. So you see some uh, overview things that, uh, that can have both mitigation and adapt ad adaptation effects. Uh, one would be environmentally responsible building design. Um, coming from the US and Canada, I think it's a pretty, uh, it's a trope amongst the, the people that I talk to that uh, Australian building standards are much different than 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 we were familiar with back in back in our home countries and by environmentally responsing uh, responsible building by f um, orienting most of the uh, the windows to be north facing to try to get the light in and warmth in during the winters by minimizing it uh, during the summer that helps uh, reduce the amount of heating costs and with insulation um, heating costs but then uh, so that re uh, reduces the amount of carbon dioxide or energy used um, but then that also can help you uh, adapt to more extreme uh, weather that if you have insulation that both protects you from uh, any uh, colder uh, changes during the winter but then also hotter uh, time periods in in um, summer months so how do we observe uh, and effect uh, and um, and assess in the report they talked about uh, Assessing a reduction in cool season rainfall and runoff in the southern areas and increase in summer rainfall in the north. As we saw with Sub-Saharan Africa, you have uh, places like in the Sahel that are getting drier while um, like in the DRC and the middle part of the country, it's uh, in the continent, it's getting substantially wetter. Increased frequency of hot compared to cold days. We saw that graph in Canberra last week. Extreme weather and detectable rises in uh, sea level. Um, so you can see um, this uh, uh, assessment and observation process happening in the beginning before moving on to uh, policies. Um, uh, other uh, reports you've seen in observ observing and assessing where a country is and what the policies are and how they relate to other practices in other countries. You can look at a lot of comparative data. Um, in looking at Australia, I haven't really talked um, that much about observing and assessing uh, energy use and policies that I think it's it's interesting now going back a, a couple of years in 2015 the highest um, uh, um, uh, emissions uh, uh, from energy consumption from a per capita basis uh, China was number one in 2015 the uh, US was number two Australia was number 17 uh, and what it also got 17th for lowest carbon intensity um, just because of uh, uh, overall person density energy productivity ranking Australia also was um, uh, was pretty good as well so you can have um, different uh, different metrics pointing in different directions 
uh, greenhouse gas emission per type of gas, you see um, a quite dramatic increase um, in uh, emissions by different states. As China economically developed, you see on the right the uh, one type of emission uh, increased, increased uh, quite dramatically, and you also see the overall trend going up uh, in other states. In where we are in the Asia Pacific, um, total emissions by our world region, um, you see it has increased as a percentage in previous years, but it's been largely pretty consistent over the last two or three decades. But you see just this huge amount of emissions um, since uh, 1950 in the last 70 years. Per capita emissions, you see also geographic clustering, as we've seen in, with a lot of things in this class with Australia, U.S. and Canada, um, having quite high CO2 emissions, um, Saudi Arabia uh, as well. And Australia on a per capita basis, it was uh, 17th uh, for energy uh, use, but just in total per capita emissions. Um, it recently surpassed the U.S., the latest data that I could find from our world and data in 2018 showed that um, we had briefly passed uh, the U.S. a couple of years ago, but then in 2017 and 2018, as a per capita basis, Australia actually uh, surpassed the U.S. and on a per capita basis is also dramatically higher than India, China, U.K., and a lot of other countries that you can look at. Coal production probably won't surprise you to see that we are number one in the world for coal production, um, dramatically higher than any other um, producer in Kazakhstan, South Africa, uh, and others. And it's, it's interesting to think about, given the market intensity and where we export our goods to that we saw in a previous week, that China, I've read in recent days, is, is talking about... Um, They've instructed people to stop buying um, coal from um, from the uh, Australian market. Be interesting to see what effect that would have on on the price as well as our export revenues. Where coal is actually produced is um, uh, clustered in in ten countries. Right, you see those uh, those. Um, UK barely barely registers there, right? And it's seventh, eighth, and eighth in the world. Uh, Eighty percent of the world's reserves going forward, right? Differentiating between what's happening now and what the reserves are in the ground. Similar with um, with oil in differentiating the different effects between um, current interests and future interests. Uh, the U.S. has uh, the largest um, coal reserves. Australia has the fourth largest, right? Russia and China in between. Our reliance on uh, renewable energy has stayed pretty uh, surprisingly constant over the last uh, over the last uh, couple of decades, with an, uh, with a quite dramatic dependency on uh, coal, oil, uh, and gas, which has um, surprised me. I thought the renewables, given the amount of solar panel installations that have occurred in recent years, that that hasn't really taken over. But all basically all energy consumption has gone uh, up. Um, pretty much monotonically over the last couple of decades as more and more people um, uh, come here. So a brief kind of snapshot for observing and assessing where Australia stands in the world, as well as understanding what the requirements are and our use of different energy sources over the last couple of decades, how much our, um, our export market is shaped by um, our, our, both our, our current exports and capacity as well as future reserves um, and where we actually rely our own resources. I know uh, ACT has pledged to go um, carbon neutral in the next couple of decades. China said by 2060 they're going to be um, carbon neutral, carbon negative. So things are in um, ANU is, is also talking about um, going carbon negative. So these things are changing quite quickly, but in observing and assessing uh, for mitigation and adaptation purposes, it's useful to kind of get a sense of the lay of the land. And so now we're going to move uh, from there to actually looking at Australian mitigation adaptation efforts. Um, but I wanted to break it up uh, for me talking uh, with a couple of videos looking at the U.S. and the Australian case. I have a few videos um, in the playlist as well as uh, on Waddle. And as you watch those, um, a couple of uh, uh, a question that I had was um, the differences between um, how U.S. politicians and military personnel talk about climate change and national security in the Economist video uh, specifically.
Um, how do you think, how does where you stand depend on where you sit, right? To what extent do you think the differences between military and politicians can be explained by the security risks faced by uh, the military and political parties? What kind of shadow of the future, what timeline is the military looking at as opposed to political parties thinking about the next election or the next couple years, right? So um, if you could think about it as you're watching the videos, respond on Waddle, and we'll come back with um, looking at Australian efforts towards mitigation and adaptation.